I wonder. <laughs> this is the part where we're not supposed to talk. I'm just a bug now. I've got multiple headphones on my head. What's up, Kiki, right now? <laughs> <laughs> Uncharacteristic behavior. Hi, everyone. Nobody would know. Nobody would know because I always cover it up. But you know what? I'm not covering up anymore. I'm not. I'm not going to be weird behind the calendar anymore. That's not happening. good for you. You let we your freak have... flag fly. I live in Portland, where weirdness is celebrated. That's right. Hello, everybody out there. <sighs> are we ready for a show? I think we're ready for a show. You guys, are you guys co-hosts ready for a show? We're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Born ready, or at I least keep, was ready at about 7.45. Yeah, and I keep waiting for Justin to tell me he's ready, and he keeps, like, saying, I hit the wrong button. I, no, I've been ready this whole – I was here ready uh, from the very beginning of – All right, you know, well – When it comes the time, to the Justins in life, you just right, start wait, when you're ready, and they'll catch up. Oh, yeah, I'm right there. I don't need prep. I'm, I'm good. All right, starting in three, two. This is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 615, recorded on Wednesday, April 19th, 2017. March for Science in April. Hey, everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your heads with halos, pigeons, and frog slime. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Forget everything you don't know. Ignore anything you didn't hear. Put off all tasks not assigned to you and pay close attention to the unknown. This world you are in is full of interesting things. Life lives here. Wonderful, wild, lush life forms are everywhere. And picture this. It all got started in the sediment at the bottom of the sea. From there to here, then to now, from ocean floor to space explore, even well before the magnificent human mind was involved, we earthlings took things to extremes. And now look around. This wondrous world about you is but a snapshot, a still image of today. If we can go as far as we've come, what futures await? will look nothing like today. And to get there from here, we will need but one thing. In science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. you kiki and blair and a, everyone. yeah and a very good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there good good science we're back with another episode of this week in science to talk about all the cool stories that caught our fancy that we thought were so interesting that we just have to share with you uh before we get to that i want to remind everyone if you are in the san francisco bay area this weekend it is Robo Games over at the Alameda County Fairgrounds in Pleasanton, California from the uh, 20th through <laughs> whatever, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't know what days. I've totally forgotten what day of the week it is. I just know it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. That's good. But anyway, Friday through Sunday of this week. It is Robo Games, and you can go to robogames.net to find out more information about that. Additionally, we are going to be in Philadelphia in June, June 10th and 11th at the Young Innovators Fair. We're gonna go check out Philly. So East Coasters, you can find us there. Young Innovatorsfair.com. All right, science news for today. I have stories about space because space is awesome, blind cave fish, because they are also awesome, and a brand new segment for the show. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. So what do you have for us, Justin? Uh, let's see. I've got uh, an innovative recycling story. I've got, oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, something to do with gut bacteria. Oh, huh. oh. Who, who knew? Another use for gut bacteria. Hmm. Uh, also, uh, new uses for marijuana and frogs. I like frogs. I don't know if I'm, I'm gut bacteria also. I'm not so into the marijuana, but you know, new after, uses. After hearing this, you, story, know. you may be. All right. I may be. Or not. Let's see. <laughs> it's a teaser. And Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, I brought very smart pigeons and lots of noise. As you normally do. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> No one's ever said such a thing about the likes of myself. Karen. No, Shouty Blair. All these names, nicknames that have come from the Blairdom. Are we ready to dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so I'm going to start it off with the new segment for this show that uh, I think is apropos to the timing. So this weekend, April 22nd, Oh, look, there's a date coming up Saturday, April 22nd. People around the world, not just in the United States, Washington, D.C. is going to probably be the, be the big one, but there are satellite marches all over, the, all over the U.S. and all over the world for science. It's Earth Day, but it is also the day that people have planned a march for science. And while there are many questions as to what this March is actually supporting and what people are actually trying to do with their marching. None of it matters. The, 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 that's the thing. The point of revolution, the clarity of vision is always right there before you have to decide those things. <laughs> like that's, that's when you can get really passionate about something before there's any details. So this is the exciting part. Yeah, it's the exciting part. We don't know how many people are going to turn out. I hope many people in our audience, um, if they can, if they're able, um, will find a march near them. And you can go to the website marchforscience.com to be able to find information about uh, this March for Science and um, and where different marches are happening. You can register, you can find the different marches around satellite marches. You can even, if you can't make it, but you'd like to support the movement, you can even donate money. Makes it easy. You can buy t-shirts and that kind of stuff. But a question has been raised as to, you know, what it really is all about. And you know, while we here at TWIST like to celebrate science, we have been discussing the importance of the practice of science, of the gathering of empirical data and its use in policy making. And so um, here at TWIST, we really do believe in the idea of decision making, informed decision making. And that being informed and using all of the data to your advantage is one of the best ways to make the best decisions. So our lives are totally impacted by science on a daily basis. It's not always policy, but we are always impacted by scientific discoveries in, in so many ways. And so we're starting a regular segment on this show, and it's going to be called... This week in What Has Science Done For You Lately? Mm -hmm. That's right. What has science done for you lately? And so what we're going to do in this first installment is tell you some ways we think science is impacting our lives on a daily basis. And then from here on out, I want to make it a weekly segment. It'll be short. It'll be sweet, but I want it to come from you. And so I please ask you to email me, to tweet at me, to Facebook me, to YouTube comment. I want to collect these comments. I want to collect emails. I want to collect stories from you to tell everybody, to share with the rest of our audience about how important science is to 
life, daily life. Because really, what we want to do is create this, and I love, I, I came up with this phraseology, of course, an ongoing compendium of scientific banality. How is it just normal science? It has prog progressed us from the Stone Age to where we are now, right? Science. And so let's get it started. I'm going to get it started. So first note of how science affects me on a daily basis is, oh, I got vaccinated. My son got vaccinated. My, my husband has been vaccinated. We have, as adults, my husband and I have been vaccinated multiple times. These vaccines help keep me safe from disease, help keep my child safe from disease. And new research out, research out this last week, the measles vaccine especially helps to keep us safe from disease because the measles, va the measles virus works with this, uh, this mechanism that they call, it causes what's called immune system amnesia, immune amnesia. And so basically, if you get infected by measles because you haven't had a vaccine, then the measles vaccine, the, me the mechanism it uses to get into your cells and to cause disease and disruption to your life, it wipes your immune system clean of its memory of how to fight off all sorts of other diseases. And so if you, and so for months afterwards, getting infected with measles, your probability of getting infected with other diseases is increased. So it's if you are like vaccinated, that. if you're vaccinated for the measles vaccine, that means the possibility of you getting infected by those other diseases goes down proportionally. And they have seen massive drops mm -hmm. in disease rates in countries, third world countries, especially where the measles vaccine has been introduced where it wasn't previously. So vaccines, boom, keeping us healthy. Yeah. And Good one. electric light. Oh, you're going to go next. Round robin. Oh, well, dun, I, dun, dun. So or did you want to comment? I was, I was, I was actually going to um, broadly say electricity, but to be more specific, um, there are two inventions um, based on this <clears throat> technology that uh, have truly impacted my life being an alarm clock but without without one <laughs> without yeah. one i'm not i probably don't wake up till like noon or one in the afternoon right i that that is uh, every day starts with that bit of technology bringing me out of slumber uh and and roosters i can sleep right through so that would work. <laughs> yeah. uh and and the other one is the dishwasher uh without which there would be oh, yeah. There's actually still dishes in the sink. I don't really understand, but it was worse before I had a dishwasher. <laughs> it was much worse. So it's, it's okay. So a twit refugee brings up something very important. That's not science, that's engineering. And so that's right. But there's also, there's a sort of debate uh, in my head about what is the benefit of science? Uh, it is those tools that we give to people uh, as well. So th they're using a tool created by science mm -hmm. to engineer these things. Uh, but without the science that came first, there is n nothing to, there is not a decent <laughs> dishwasher made in the Stone Age. I mean, okay. dishwashers, it's using the erosive property of water as well of, as physics of the pressure of the water against dishes to clean your dishes. Yeah, right? there's, there's I mean, a lot going on. And then any, any detergents on top of it. Detergents is science, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's chemistry. a chemical reaction. Chemical yeah. reaction. Yeah. 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 But okay, also any engineering at all, uh, the the trial and error involved in designing a new piece of technology is based in the scientific method, also, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Blair, what are your, what you got? Oh, there? well, my first one is the field of optometry. Um, I am extremely nearsighted about uh, minus five and a change in both eyes, and I have an astigmatism. And without science, I am pretty sure I would not be alive today because I would have <laughs> fallen off a cliff, gotten eaten by a wild animal. Who knows? But I would, I would not be here without optometry. 
Um, it's one of those little things that it's just you take for granted. I think about right? it all the time, actually, because I <laughs> I run did. I run into doors that are open and sideways. I run into the side of a door when I get up in the middle of the night and I'm not wearing my glasses. That is how much so, I cannot so you're see. Saying if it wasn't for optometry, yes. you would be like a panda in the wild. Ooh. I'd be worse than a panda. I'd be dead. <laughs> I'd absolutely be dead. <laughs> Um, and on a on a kind of more somber note, um, I spent over an hour before the show started talking to my roommate and best friend who was born premature. And without mm. the research and medical care available to premature yeah. babies, she wouldn't be here. And my life would be very, very different. You wouldn't have your best friend. Yeah. Very, very true. And you know what? The electrical lights right here illuminating our show. This show would be in the dark without electrical lights. Electrical lights of the fluorescent or incandescent or LED form. Electrical lights, light, light. Can you imagine? Before light, there was dark and we had to go to bed when the sun yeah. went down. Candlelight and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. I guess it's bedtime now. I good night, know. everyone. Yeah, good night, everyone. Oops, the sun's just gone down, so no more twists. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you sometime afternoon, sometime in the afternoon, early in the afternoon tomorrow. Yeah, uh, so uh, Justin would be a, awake for three reason. hours of the day is what we're learning without <laughs> science. No alarm clock, no light. <laughs> Justin's got about a three-hour window. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to be the candle maker. That's the thing. That would have to be my job, so just so I could see at night. Yeah. We're going to be up anyway. I might as well be making candles all night. I love it. I know everyone in the chat chat room has come up with a ton of uh, scientific influences Send to their to life. Send them to me. I'm watching these scroll by and I'm very excited. What is that email they can reach you at, Kirsten? Just so you can know. email me at Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com. There it is. Ta-da! Yeah, and I want to do this every week. Every week, everyone. Let's keep it going year round. Let's show that science influences us every day, every week for the following year. Let's I already do. used my top two, and I'm going to have to dig just slightly. Gotta, it won't actually dig. be hard. You'll just have to look around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, no, oh my gosh. Look I got your message and I, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to think about this. And then a minute later, I had my answers. Yeah. So that does it for yeah. this weekend. What has science done for you lately? Ooh, that sounds like a sound bite. Right. <laughs> All right. Now let's move into some scientific research. Researchers have been uh, peering at dark matter, but they haven't really been looking at dark matter because you can't see it, right? Dark matter is matter that you can't see. That's the technicality right. of the name, right? Dark. It's dark. Yeah. It doesn't have a light bulb yet. Um, so some researchers have been taking data from pairs of baryonic matter, light producing objects, things that we can see. And so they looked at 23,000 pairs of luminous red galaxies, LRGs, and they're really bright galaxies, easy to tell apart from other galaxies. And so they're not getting confused about you know, what they're actually looking at. And they took pairs of them and we're like, all right, let's look at the weak lensing. And we've talked about lensing before. This is how matter or mass tends to distort or bend light as it passes through it because the, the mass can actually attract the light and that, thus change the path of the light and shift it um, in, a diff in, a, in one direction or the other. And so they measured the weak lensing. It's just like, they're looking for a connection between pairs of these LRGs. And so they looked between them and they're like, all right, is there lensing happening there? And it really, it's like not a lot of lensing between these galaxies, not a ton. But what they did is these 23,000 pairs, they measured it, the lensing, the shift in the light between these galaxies. And what they were to do is able to come up with an average and then because they came up with an average, they were then able to subtract out any, dis any, um, any noise 
from the signals. And so because they had an average, take it out of all of the connections between these 23,000 pairs of galaxies. And what they were left with, they statistically propose, is dark matter. And so historically, we have not been able to see dark matter, but we have seen the clumping of matter in our galaxy, um, not in our galaxy, in the universe. And we, so we've seen these clumps, but we know that there are filaments between that run between different parts of our universe, connecting things together. And they've proposed that dark matter's there, but it just wouldn't be a lot of dark matter, so it'd be hard to see and hard to d distinguish from the noise. And so now they've come up with a method to remove the noise. And they have statistically seen dark matter connecting galaxies for the first time. Filaments mm -hmm. of dark matter. Mm -hmm. Aha! Yeah, so they haven't actually seen it. Yeah. It's all statistics. Yeah. But, you know, this is now a methodology that could be potentially used. <laughs> could be, potentially. <laughs> and And... and... <laughs> But I, I do love how it's like, we're, we're going to take averages. We're going to get rid of all the, it, it's sort of like sort of a classical physicist thing to do too. Okay. We're going to describe a cow. Okay. First, let's assume the cow is perfectly spherical. Okay. And going from there, then we can say something about what a cow is. Right? Like, yeah. Okay. All right. And I will, Kevin Unique in the chat room is correcting me. And I will take this correction to heart because you are absolutely right. I simplified things much too much. I should have said bent the pathway of the light uh, because what happens, mass bends space. If we've ever seen the, the marble dropped on a, uh, on a elastic sheet and it bends Which an elastic sheet. I never like that. I, never, I can't. Yeah, but the idea, light always travels in a straight line, but the space is bent and so the light has to... Mm -hmm in that line in this space and so the path in through space has been so kevin unique thank you very much for that clarification because that's it that's important that is important to the physical understanding of this yeah um and then uh, another researcher other researchers looking at the sloan digital sky survey have been trying to figure out hey is our milky way galaxy like other galaxies that we see other galaxies look they have this big cloud of hydrogen gas around them. Do we have that? And I love this, um, this, this description that was from a press release out of the University of Arizona. It's kind of this description of trying to figure out what our own galaxy looks like is as if you are trying to figure out what your house looks like, but you're like stuck in one room of your house. Right. And you know, so how do you figure out what your entire house looks like from the outside if you can never go outside to see it? Right. How do we do yeah. that? So, so you start by looking out the window and seeing <laughs> if there's some other some houses. You see other houses all around. The other houses. Yeah. Okay. That's they all seem to have an awning and a front porch and a and a uh, some sort of garage. And then I'm looking at the people, and then like, oh my goodness. Look, there is a little bit of a porch kind of around the front of my mm -hmm. door. So, like, you exactly. can uh, get those clues from outside of yourself to find out what's going in, on in you or where you are. Yeah, and also um, looking at how light is, uh, what, what things look like and how you would expect them to look if there were nothing between us and these other objects or if there were something in between, and so the uh, one of the researchers on this uh, this paper, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Astronomy at the Stewart Observatory, says it's like peering through a veil. We see diffuse hydrogen in every direction we look, and now it's not like hydrogen here on Earth, which is two hydrogen mo molecules bonded together. This is just single molecules, single atoms of hydrogen diffusely floating around. And so what they have found by these observations from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, looking at other galaxies and figuring things out from this peering out the window of our Milky Way house, uh, they published in Nature Astronomy, uh, based on the spectra of light that we're seeing, um, and they've determined that we have a halo of hydrogen around our Milky Way. And now this is not hydrogen in the 
a galactic disk, this hydrogen is not moving with us. It's not spinning hmm. w with our spiral galaxy. It is actually a halo that is it's doing its own thing outside That's of our galaxy. <laughs> and it turns out we're the only galaxy that has hydrogen surrounding us, as far as we can tell, because everywhere we look, it seems to have it. Turns out we were it's our own gas. No, I don't know that that's part of it. But what, I mean, <laughs> is, it, is there a little bit of like, wow, there's hydrogen everywhere out there. And then it turns yeah. out we're. No, there's hydrogen there's everywhere out hydrogen. there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there is, or maybe it's just us after all. Yeah. And so uh, they looked at how uh, we talked, I said, or talked earlier about the shift in light. They looked at the shift in the light to see whether or not the hydrogen was moving with us or away from us or what was going on. And based on the light signal that they got in this hydrogen spectra, it's just this, we have a, the Milky Way has a hydrogen gas halo. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting way to kind of figure this out. I wonder if it's, it's some sort of, well, it's, wow, interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and then moving into our own planet, we've got a little bit of this week in the end of the world. Uh, people in the Western United States, oh, I know we've been getting lots and lots of rain from the La Nina this year, but don't bet on that being the norm. A new uh, analysis published in Nature Communications is uh, saying that based on their analysis, um, the observations and reanalyses indicate that between the 1980s and 2000s, there was a 10 to 20% loss in the annual maximum amount of water contained in the snowpack of the Western United mm. States. And this is consistent with the results from a lot of different climate simulations with forced, with natural and anthropogenic changes. <coughs> But if you take away the anthropogenic and do natural alone, it doesn't match up. So anthrop it's anthropogenic changes that are involved. And we've talked about this previously. And a further loss of up to 60% of snowpack is projected within the next 30 years. 30 years? Oh, 60%? my goodness. 60%? That 60%. 60% uh, And if you thought the mountains, you know, the, the, the western, the, the mountains along western, uh, eastern California, looking at the snowpack, people are complaining about the skiing before the rains came again. Um, you know, if it's not just skiing that's going to be affected, it's also water supplies to various regions. San Francisco gets most of its water from those eastern mountains, mm -hmm. and from the snowpack. It's not just water supply for uh, communities, it's also hydroelectric dams. It's also, so it's energy, it's fishing, it's um, the ecology of the regions are going to be incredibly effect, affected. And for just a small example of how they could be so uh, dramatically affected, uh, researchers reported also um, just this last week about a river in Canada that just up and disappeared over the, the, the course of four days. It was the Slims River, and it carried meltwater north from the Kaskawalsh Glacier in the Yukon Territory. And then it kind of goes north and then uh, out west toward the Bering Sea, but... Uh, in 2016, there was melting of the glacier, and then this the 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 balance was tipped as to where the meltwater went, and it all ended up going uh, to a second river that redirects the meltwater to the Gulf of Alaska. So uh, they've they've followed this, and there it's this is the kind of thing that can happen. C rivers can dis disappear over very brief periods of time. And what's going to happen is that area that was receiving that water, sheep that were in protected territories are now moving to find food into areas where they're going to be more aggressively hunted. Uh, we're going to see movements of animals trying to find food and water. There's not going to be uh, that resource available in that, uh, that area. So the entire ecology of the area will be affected, and not just right there, but downstream. 
And speaking of ecology, the something that really concerns me, for example, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, but anywhere where you have an estuary, is sea levels are rising, and at the same time, these snowpacks are degrading and so there's less fresh water pouring in. So you have massive, a one-two punch of saltwater intrusion in these uh, estuaries, in these bays. And so areas that were, you know, 50-50 saltwater, freshwater, areas that were more fresh than salt, closer up to the delta, um, those things are going to get saltier and saltier and saltier. And the plants and animals that are used to living in a specific type of saltiness are suddenly going to find way saltier water, the entire ecosystems are going to have to change. Yep. Things are going to change. And while we've seen a lot of things over our lifetime, lifetime seem to change relatively slowly, things are speeding up. And I mean, I don't know if rivers disappear over the course of four days. <laughs> that's, that really, that's really fast. That's quick. Nobody can keep up with that. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, oh, good news for the future. Uh, you know, the, the, the part that we kind of highlighted is the least important bit of this, being that people won't be able to go skiing or snowboarding as much, um, might also be uh, a catalyst for a lot of people who enjoy doing that activity but may have paid no attention uh, to global warming. <laughs> Getting on more, being like, what? You mean I can't ski anymore? That's part of it? Oh, no. Or, your, or your, white ro your white water rafting will be impacted. Or Actually, your fishing adventure. The low waters, quicker rapids. You never know. You, never you know, know, or eating food that require fresh water. Oh, wow. What? Or, or, <laughs> There's that or, whole yeah, chestnut. We to, we'll also get a lot of people on board when we have to go to even lower flow toilets. Yes. Like they just don't work anymore. It's <laughs> <laughs> called a porta potty. We're going back to outhouses. <laughs> Get your lie mm. here. Got your lie. All right, Justin. What did you bring? Can you cheer me up? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a reduce, reuse, recycle story. Uh, just one of the ways we can try to keep the planet less garbage heapy and also reduce Yay! carbon emission. Uh, from uh, having to remanufacture things. Even within today's current recycling programs that we got going, there are billions of glass bottles ending up in landfills every year. Uh, and I think a little bit of that is they're not as aggressively pursued uh, in recycling because you're turning sand into glass. I think, I, and I've heard, and I could be wrong, that the carbon footprint, the, the difference between recycling glass and just getting it something turned into glass isn't that big of a difference so maybe that's why there's a little bit less em emphasis not sure but now researchers at the university of california riverside borns college of engineering have found a high-end application for the discarded bottles by applying a low-cost chemical process they created nano silicone anodes Yay! What are those? Uh, they're for high-performance lithium-ion batteries. Ooh. The batteries will extend the range of electric vehicles, plug in hybrid electric vehicles, provide more power with fewer charges to personal electronics like cell phones and laptops and personal electronic-type devices. An article describing the research was published in the National Journal Scientific Reports. Uh, Cengiz Oskan, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and Miri Oskan, Professor of Electrical Engineering, led the project. Even with today's recycling programs, all these bottles are going to waste. But this, this, this little tweak that they've done, uh, let me get down to where, uh, okay, so to create the anodes, the team used a three-step process that involved crushing and grinding the glass bottles into a fine white powder, a magnesiothermic reduction to transform the silicon dioxide into nanostructured silicon and coating the silicon nanoparticles with carbon to improve their stability and energy storage properties. But would it actually work now that they've, they went and did it? Will it work? Yes. <laughs> yes, it did. They made coin back cell batteries using recycled battery, bottle-based ba silicon anodes, and they not only worked, they greatly outperformed traditional batteries in laboratory tests. 
<laughs> I'd love that if you reported all of that and then you said, oh, but it didn't work. And then like, no, it didn't work. <laughs> so yes, God, I think it worked because mine didn't. This is uh, Cheng Ling Li, a graduate student in materials science and engineering lead author in the paper said, one glass bottle provides enough nano silicon for hundreds of coin cell batteries or three five or three five pouch cell batteries. I don't know what size those actually are. We started with a waste product that was headed for the landfill and created batteries that stored more energy, charged faster, and were more stable than commercial coin cell batteries. Hence, we have very promising candidates. Lithium ion batteries, Lee said. Uh, research is a series of projects by the OSCONs to create lithium ion battery anodes from environmentally friendly materials. Previous research has focused on developing and testing anodes from portobello mushrooms. Oh my God. <laughs> and and, uh, and dirt. Uh, fossil rich dirt at that. Nice. Fossil um, rich dirt. But mushrooms. But yeah, but good. I don't. I don't ever like it when. I never like it when science finds a new application for food. As as, you're right. Bio friendly as it is, I'm like, oh great. What's a portobello mushroom going to cost now that they're using it to make batteries out of? Now I can't. Now they're really going to be expensive. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan. I mean, it's like okay, you can use biomass for stuff, yeah. but I mean, why not use the trimmings and the waste products from food production? So corn stalks or yeah, yeah. yeah. The stuff like you know composting it's great you can get uh, natural gases off the methane off of uh, off of composting to help run cities or things that we need stuff like that is good and like dick tells saying in the uh, the chat room switchgrass but do you have to use up land to yeah. grow switchgrass I don't know so I don't know if switchgrass really worked out too well it's sort of like corn like nobody's talking about uh, the ethanol thing so much anymore uh, yeah, I, I know. And, and you know, once we build a wall to Mexico, you know, whether or not people have corn for their tortillas, nobody's going to care anymore. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to me. Okay. So this is, I, I love it. Glass into batteries. Let's now, if they just start things, offering other things. a penny more than CRV, they well, won't yeah. even have to acquire the glass. People just bring it to them. Just and and I, think, mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that is the upside of this. Uh, 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 another upside of this is that uh, you, if you find the really useful application uh, for, for something that would be waste, uh, then yeah, it is worth that couple of pennies a bottle that mm -hmm. makes it so that it's, it's, it's more aggressively recycled. Uh, Absolutely, so yeah. This is this is going to this is going to this is heading the right direction. And 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 faster charging, longer lasting electronics. Uh, it's fixing the other side of the problem too. Yeah. But uh, as my uh, my favorite invention, right, of science, the alarm clock. Mine seems to be going off, telling me it's time once again for Blair's Animal Corner. Yes. What you got, Blair? She loves her. Another song. Let's dance again. Let's do it again. Oh, it's great. Let's do okay. it one more time. So I brought some stories about pigeons. Very first story about pigeons and how smart they are. What do you think we found? Any guesses? Pigeons, pigeons are is dumb. <laughs> no. <laughs> Usually, there you go. when Blair brings a story to the Blair's Animal Corner about the intelligence of an animal, usually uh, I'm saying, we underestimated them, right? So mm -hmm. this story is no different. It's a new study from Oxford University looking at homing pigeons. But in particular, it's about cumulative culture. Cumulative culture is knowledge over generations that are ga that's gathered and passed on and improved on over time. So in this study, they tested whether homing pigeons can gradually improve their flight paths over time. So what they did is they 
removed and replaced individuals in pairs of birds, and they were given a specific navigational task. Ten chains of birds were released from the same site, and in generational succession, they were simulated um, with the continuous replacement of birds familiar with the route with inexperienced birds who had never flown the course before. So in each of these pairs, bird familiar, bird not. Then they took the bird not familiar, now familiar, place them with another bird who is still not yet familiar. So it's like a game of telephone. The idea was that individuals could pass the experience they learned from the of the route down to the next generation, quote unquote, mm -hmm. and that over time, the collective intelligence of the group would improve and the roots efficiency would also improve. They found this to be true. So the homing performance improved consistently over generations. The route was streamlined and was more direct over time. And later generation groups eventually outperformed individuals that flew solo or in groups that never changed membership. Wow. What we're seeing here overall, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This is proving that. This is a teamwork scenario. This is a, again, cumulative culture scenario. This is uh, every pigeon has a different strength and they can build on each other's strengths to come up with a greater idea. Yeah, that's it's amazing. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's like, that sounds like human learning. Exactly. And so this has only ever been demonstrated in humans and in a couple different primates. This is the Orangutans, first time. Yeah. yeah, it's the first time in any non-primate animal that they have found this phenomenon. Now, if you ask me, I have heard crow studies that sound like this. They were not systematically testing this hypothesis, so they can't for sure say that's what was going on. But I have heard several crow studies that sound like this is the phenomenon. And I think it makes nothing but sense that in any sort of social animal species, they would build on generational knowledge over time. It just seems think, like a good idea. Yeah. What, what's interesting about this is that it's different from uh, like instinctual migration where there is some amount of learning that does take place, but there are birds who just, they, they, they're, young birds they've never flown south before and they just got to get up and go mm -hmm. and then they then they figure it out and learn where everybody else went once they kind of get to the right place but um but they do it anyway and this is a little bit different because this is just a learning this is young birds learning from older birds mm -hmm. where they're going well, what is the path well, yeah but hold on uh, it's, and, the, and, pigeons are they have a different a different behavior than than I'll, do I'll, migration although birds. Even in that migrational bird, uh, it, it could be taking place because the efficiency mm -hmm. of the route, right? Mm -hmm. uh, learning yeah. the route that the other birds took. And those are, they've, where did they learn this route? Well, they learned it because they flew with birds that had done this a uh, number of times. So where did those birds learn it? Right. And so, and so it, it may still be taking place there, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's, it, it looks just like it's the natural behavior. But the actual mm -hmm. final route after a couple of times of doing it uh, is, is part of both. A little bit of both. Right. right. And that leads to their next step of the study, which is still to come. Um, they're going to investigate if a similar style of knowledge sharing and, and knowledge accumulation happens when they do multi-generational species of um, social groups. So this mm -hmm. was simulated generations, right? So they, they took a, a pigeon that just learned and had them teach someone else. They want to actually take S entire social groups and see if knowledge is passed and improved upon through generations, which will be very interesting to see. And Absolutely. Kevin Unique in the chat room asks, so Blair Baz, did they compare female pigeons with male pigeons? I'm so glad you asked, Kevin, because my next study is all about the differences among the, the sexes in pigeons. It's almost like you're working for me, Kevin. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for segueing oh, me. Yes. Yes. So in a lot of scientific studies that we have reported on in the show, but just also on the grand scheme of studies that involve lab animals, a lot of those research cases, if they're not directly related to reproduction, 
they don't choose an equal number of males and females as their test subjects. And a lot of the time, they use mostly males. That is an interesting tactic <laughs> based on some things we've learned in this show already. And a new study by researchers at UC Davis and U University of New Hampshire looked at specifically the genetics between male and female rock doves, pigeons. They wanted to see if there were genetic differences beyond reproductive areas of the genome. And what do you think they found, Justin? Absolutely no differences. <laughs> nope. They found a lot of difference. <laughs> yeah. So they found that when they looked at the genetics of these guys, and particularly at the pituitary gland in the hypothalamus, uh, which is controlled by the hypothalamus. Mm. Um, these are areas that are not technically, so they're, you know, they're adjacent to hormone creation and, and things related to reproduction, but they should not be in themselves that different. They found hundreds of differences in their genome. So this, this difference was, was fascinating. Not only the difference in the genome, but the differences in the gene activity between males and females was astounding. And this shows that there are way more sex-based differences, at least in the pituitary, than they had previously thought, than previously um, kind of the, the idea was in, in these animals in relation to research and all these sorts of things. So this doesn't mean we have to throw everything out. But just like in previous studies where we found out we've been keeping rats or mice too cold, we found that, you know, there are certain things about the way we, that we handle lab animals that could be affecting our studies. Part of being scientists and part of science is making sure that our tools are up to date, that we're using the best data, that we're using the best equations, that we're using the best subjects. And now when we continue to hone our scientific method for research with animals in laboratories, it's about time we start looking at differences in the sexes to whatever it is we're studying. The perfect example of that is aspirin. There's, there's now been proven a huge difference in the way aspirin affects men and women. Women report a higher rate of adverse reactions to mm. aspirin than men do in clinical trials and studies. So we know this. We know that men and women have these fundamental differences and it's about time that we start using that as a variable to watch. Especially when we're talking about uh, drugs for yeah. study. You know, if you're talking about drugs, maybe we should be looking at how they interact with, oh, you know, a uh, different hormone makeup. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah, so but, to yeah, say the becomes, sexes are not different, yeah. they're, we, we can talk all we want about how they are equal in a lot of ways, but they are very different. Equal and is not the same as different. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, one is, one, is a, one is a legal definition. Right, right. right. And, but but it is one of those is... things where, you know, you can throw a ball, I can throw a ball. But when we look inside of our genetic makeup, there are fundamental differences in our biology. And that's the thing that we, we have to remember in, whenever we're doing any science is to control our variables, right? So this is just another variable that we need to control and be aware of in our scientific studies. And then we also have to make sure that we haven't only been doing our research on westernized uh white people <laughs> right? right like i mean that's it's, it's just another there's variable a lot. there's a lot of variables there's and, a lot and of this variables. is and this is and this just means that there's a lot of room for more science research to be done yeah absolutely and so the point of this study was that even when you're dealing with something like a pigeon male and female subjects are fundamentally different to the genomic level which means it's important to use both in your studies. <laughs> or or not. I mean, does that, or equal amounts of each, I guess. Yeah. Uh, 
Otherwise, I mean, would you really have to label this study a study of male pigeons? Uh, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. It would. yeah. Absolutely. That's unless what you have you to use, say now. And if you, you use... approve something for male pigeons, it is only approved for male pigeons. Mm -hmm. Just like if you have not tested if a drug has uh, side effects when paired with other drugs yet, you cannot confidently say whether or not a drug will be good for females if you've only tested it on males. Yeah. yeah totally. okay. And, and, you know, there's, there's, there's places where there's places where I've, I've, I've seen technology catch up to that in, in the automotive industry when for decade uh, is, is decade is, is this decades a little over a decade. Uh, all airbags were designed for men, 5'11", 165, right. 170 mm, right, yeah. uh, There are and now... Women are smaller. Are, right, women are smaller. Well, or bigger. Like, or bigger, yeah, different you know, sizes. There's a whole range of people of, of both sexes and different sizes. Uh, one of the things that's changed there is there's, there are sensors now that, that determine where how far, far forward the seat is. There's some in, in some vehicles that determines where the actual steering wheel is is tilted or telescoped. It can. There's weight sensors that that will of the weight of the passenger, and it takes into account the speed of the accident as well. Because not every accident, a a 55 mile an hour head on collision and a 25 mile an hour rear ending of another vehicle have collision. Actually, it's totally the same thing. Um, have have different effects on, or uh, require different speed of opening of the airbag. And then depending right. on where the position of the passengers and the size of the passenger, all these things now are taken into account. Uh, so going forward, the world is only going to get more complicated. Uh, and I'd as say that's we accurate. Into those complications, we can handle all of it. We can we handle really can. it all. We can oh, yeah. All. We can do this. The world we're is good not. At this. this is what we're really good at. It's the... really our superpower handling yeah. complicated stuff. Yeah. You know what? And I'm actually very excited that the world beyond, you know, science and beyond is really coming to that appreciation that the world is not filled with white males of the height five foot 11. I think it's great that the world's more complicated than that. And on this note, you know, it's also not just pigeons all the way down, not rats all the way down, not mice all the way down. It's, you know, many different animals are going to help us get to this understanding, oh, it was turtles. including people and turtles, turtles it's all the way down. Turtles. Yeah, and it's, throw all these other animals it's, it's time for us to come to the end of our first, first half. half. There's a whole second half after the first half. This isn't the whole show. This, this is, is cool. just the beginning portion of the whole show. Amazing. Amazing. So I hope you do stay tuned. We've got a few messages for you right now. This is This Week in Science. We'll be back after the break with lots of science. We've got marijuana for you and uh, frogs and blind cavefish. Lots of stuff happening in the second act. Stay tuned. <laughs> Shows the way to go. No conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. We're not a pair of goggles and we're looking for the things I do. Hey everybody, this is This Week in Science and I just wanna say thank you to all of you for continuing to watch or listen to TWIS and, uh, and to appreciate the science that we bring to you week after week after week. There's gonna be lots more coming after this break, next week, the week after that. I'm gonna be at Robo Games this weekend talking to robotics uh, 
roboticists, people who are building robots, people who are competing. I mean, it's going to be at uh, robogames.net is where you can find information. Robogames is at the Alameda County Fairgrounds in Pleasanton, California, this weekend, 21st through the 23rd of April. And uh, you can also catch it live online, which is very exciting, on Twitch. That's right. You can find it on twitch.tv slash robogames. And it should be on all week. You might catch me on there if you're interested. I don't know. I'm going to be doing that this weekend. And then in June, the whole Twist team is heading to Philadelphia or to Philly for the Young Innovators Fair to live broadcast the whole weekend of June 10th and 11th. And if you've got a young one or if you just want to come out to the Young Innovators Fair, please do. We would love to see you there. Hope we can get you out to the fair. You can find information at younginnovatorsfair.com. And for those of you who continue to appreciate the science that we bring to you week after week here on This Week in Science, you know, This Week in Science does have bills we need to pay and you help out constantly, constantly help us produce this show with your purchases and your donations and also your just sharing of twists. Really, all these things, buying our stuff, our merchandise, and helping us out on, on PayPal and Patreon, and then also sharing us with your friends, family, colleagues, all the other on social media. This is part of helping Twist continue to do what it does and also to grow. And so I just want to thank you for that. We have merchandise. If you head over to twist.org, so you can go to our website, it's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. Head right over there, and if you click on the Zazzle store link that is in the main header bar, that'll take you to our Zazzle store where you will be able to find all sorts of wonderful goodies that you can purchase. And it looks like right now there's a, a sale going on for Zazzle. Tax season sale on Zazzle. Purchases at Zazzle do go toward helping out This Week in Science. Also at twist.org, if you scroll down the sidebar, you can find that nice donate button along the side and click on that. It takes you to an interface for PayPal. And you can just donate very easily, um, just a flat fee, uh, just once if you want. Um, or, you know, you can click on that bu button multiple times if you'd like. But if you want to donate on an ongoing basis, then the way that you can do that really easily is clicking on our Patreon link, which is in the main header at twist.org. Additionally, it's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash This Week in Science, where if you just click on a button, become a patron, you can be a patron of our sciencey arts and help us keep doing this show week after week after week and help us to reach our goal, our fundraising goals to be able to really make this show move. And uh, you are the people that help us do that. And the, the way you get to all these places easily is through twist.org. But don't forget, if you are not able to financially help produce twists, uh, we could really use your help in getting the word out. So if you're watching us on YouTube right now, hello there. If you're on Facebook, hi. If you're anywhere else near Twitter or Instagram, I don't know, Snapchat, take a short video. Share the video that we're currently putting out. Share a link to twist.org. Help us get the word out because it would be wonderful to bring more people under the twist minion banner right? We need more, more minions, more minions. We really could not do this without you. Thank you so much for your support. Power that I do believe is the dollars and cents all these authors receive. If miracle wonders were held in their looks, why waste precious time and try Paris. selling their books? Why sit and wait for your publishing royalty if one has real power who needs real loyalty if you could travel by thought to a mystical place why go to book signings and fight for shelf space and we're back with more this week in science and we're back again with even more more this week in science what you got justin tell me some science oh is it my turn Okay. Uh, colorectal cancer. 
but is the second leading cause of cancer associated death in the United States. Best way to prevent dying from it? Early, 90% survival rate if found early. So get those invasive colonoscopies early and often and to catch it as early as possible, have them daily. Mm. Or perhaps, ah, that's a bit much. There, there is another way. Turns out the type of bacteria in your gut may be enough to make the diagnosis. Researchers, Baylor College of Medicine, other institutions, have identified specific types of bacteria that seem to be abundant in individuals with colorectal cancer. Using a combination of markers specific for these fecal microbes, scientists anticipate that a non-invasive clinical diagnostic test can be developed. A uh, study is published in Gut, which I should probably get a subscription to. Yeah, you <laughs> should. I get the high volume of these. <laughs> Uh, Quotey Voice, this is uh, Dr. Manasi Shah. She says, a number of studies have shown an association between fecal microbes and colorectal cancer. However, there is limited agreement in the types of microbes reported. So I was interested, not me or her. Uh, I was interested, I'm, this is Quotey Voice. I was interested in finding a microbial marker for the disease. One way to do this is by carrying out a single institutional study. But that takes a long time for a sample collection. It involves sequencing the microbes' DNA. It's expensive. I noticed that some of the published studies provided the means for assessing the raw microbial DNA sequencing data of those samples. How great it would be, I thought. Not me, but this is Dr. Shaw again. I thought if I could leverage existing raw data across multiple cohorts and come up with a generalizable marker for the disease. Shaw, uh, Shaw then teamed up with Dr. Emily Hollister, assistant professor of pathology at Baylor, who in her own quotey voice, Shaw had the interest, we had the expertise. Hollister said, in our center, we had been planning to compare a series of different statistical tools to analyze large amounts of microbi microbiome data. Shaw's proposal fit very well with our goal. So Hollister uh, was working with the actual DNA sequencing uh, machinery, this is advanced DNA sequencing uh, machinery, and and Sha is more of the statistical end of this. The two combined their superpowers. They uh, reanalyzed raw bacterial DNA sequence data from several studies and confirmed previously reported types of bacteria associated with colorectal cancer and identified other bacteria not previously associated with the disease. Uh, so this is in Sha. The fact that even when we combine several different studies, we could correctly classify a sample as colorectal cancer ca case or control with 80% accuracy solely based on microbial abundances is very encouraging. This is a promising first step to develop the non-invasive test that might be used in the detection of this cancer, supplementing colonoscopy or fecal occult uh, blood tests, which only says that there's blood there. It's kind of uh, and there is there is a DNA poo test that can be taken that can uh, alert you to mutated DNA being somewhere in that system, but they're not very they're they're not really as pinpoint as this would be like aha this is very likely this form of cancer is what we've discovered with this. Um, and part of part of what made this you know when we talk about there being noise in an experiment, they had actually a, a pretty tough time getting this data. Uh, they reached out to 12 of these studies, only got the full data from, I think, seven of them, seven or nine of them, maybe. Uh, and what they also found was these are these were research projects that happened uh, across, they were international. They were pulling from other countries. The way that the, the data was compiled, the systems, the computer systems that they were on, they had a ton of roadblocks in getting getting down to the, the core of what they were looking for. And actually, sort of because of that, I think, this study's pretty encouraging because it was nine out of the 12 studies uh, that, that they actually got the information from. Uh, encouraging because within all of that noise, despite all of that noise, the, the sort of correlation managed to rise out of that those data sets as markers. So, if you can imagine having a, a better controlled environment for all of these studies, but the same platforms, the same way of uh, controlling the samples that are being used, 
the chances might just increase well beyond that 80%. 80% is a dry run with kind of uncontrollable, you know, sample collection preservation uh, systems that they were using to, to get this. Uh, and, and they kind of go on, this is uh, Shaga, and the same strategy that we use could be applied for developing diagnostic tests for other diseases. And they, she mentions inflammatory bowel disease, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, so list goes on, uh, among others uh, for which the microbiome is currently being investigated. So all of, the, all of these things that we've, we've been discovering about our microbiome and the connections it has into the health of our, our entire body and mental states and everything else, we may be, uh, we may be also able to diagnose disease from paying attention to how our microbiome is reacting. I love it. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. How's, what is the microbiome doing? What does that tell us? It knows all. Mm -hmm. our bi seriously, right? I mean, forget reading tea leaves. I want someone to read my microbiome. Yeah, they can scatter anywhere. I want. <laughs> I, I mean, you can look at my scat. I mean, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take us back to a uh, topic that we have discussed many times before. Young blood for old benefits. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah. And a new study published in uh, Springer Nature. It is, uh, this is a research letter, Springer Nature research letters. Um, this is a study in which uh, researchers basically gave uh, umbilical cord plasma to old mice. And they found that when they uh, gave umbilical cord plasma treatments to these old mice, it revitalized their hippocampuses and improved cognitive function. These old mice started acting like young mice yet again. So here we are, cord blood. Everybody who's been saving their baby's cord blood, maybe it's not for your baby, maybe it's for you. <laughs> so that was my question. Whose umbilical cord were they using? That of the very same mouse? Or... No, this is human. Human. Oh, this is... oh interesting. They used I, I was, human. I mouse. But, yeah. Cord plasma. Yeah, they used oh. human, human cord plasma. And so then they're like, all right, what is going on? And, you know, specifically, I mean, interesting that this would affect aged mice. Um, they started looking at the different compounds were, that were in this plasma, and they found one in particular that is called tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases 2 or TIMP2. And this is a bloodborne factor that is enriched, there's a lot of it, in human cord plasma. Um, it's also in young mouse plasma, yeah, and um, it's also found uh, a lot in young mouse hippocampi. So baby mouse hippocampuses have this TIMP2 in it. We don't really know what it does particularly, but there's it's increased during this developmental stage, at least in young mice, in this particular area of the brain, which we know to be involved in cognition, learning, and memory. Yeah. Um, so, so this, this, this uh, maybe slightly macabre margarita it, night at the old. Can I also? Home. It also increases synaptic plasticity, which is amazing. Okay, go ahead, margarita night in the old folks' home. Yeah, um, is is not the destination of of this research uh the destination of this research is finding a way to simulate uh what yes. we're seeing take place yes in another fashion absolutely uh so we we won't um yeah so the um, interest but, is this compound temp2 and so if we can uh determine exactly what temp2 is doing how it has its beneficial effect is this either this compound itself or something related to it something that we can synthetically produce or you know can we isolate it from 
from from cells? Can we have it made in in eggs? You know, how can we potentially produce a compound that it that it it interacts with a target or uh, this particular compound itself? Uh, what could we potentially do to make it available to people to be able to reduce yeah. cognitive decline? Yes. And, um, and this is, you know, this is one of my my biggest fears too, is is losing what cognitive abilities I I have. I don't want to give them up. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, right? I don't yeah. care about, I don't care if I have wrinkles. I don't care if my hair falls out. I don't care if I have I, these things don't bother me in the least, but I don't want to. I don't want to lose uh, any any more uh, than what I have already through uh, attrition. <laughs> right. I mean, I I would love to keep what I've you know what cognitive abilities I still have left. Yeah. I've loved. I, I would love to keep them as, for as long as possible. Right. And we know that we are in a phase of life uh, in which our brains are not. They're not getting any snappier. They're they're they've are we mid thirties, early thirties. We already started our cognitive decline. It's all, it's already on the way down. So if we can lessen it, make that the slope of that line of decline a little less steep, that would be amazing. And for individuals who have genetic disorders that predispose them to uh, rapid onset cognitive. Uh, disorders that would be a, it would be amazing to be able to counter that with uh, with factors that can be discovered through research like this as it is right now we're doing it once again we're helping we're helping mice we're not helping people at this point in time right now if you have a, a mouse with forever. mouse with dementia we know exactly how to treat it <laughs> what was it male or female mice Oh, oh, Blair. There we go. Again. And what Blair, temperature Blair, were they Blair. and how were they handled? Blair, Blair. <laughs> Just questions. That's a great question. And I did not look into it in this. I, I did not look at the <laughs> cohort. I'm looking at the paper right now and it's a lot of words and figures. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Oh, message. Just, just a question to the group, not particularly oh, to you. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Aged male WTC57BL slash six mice. Male mice. This is only male mice. Mm -hmm. They were obtained from the National Institute on Aging Aged Rodent Colony. Mm -hmm. Young. Which for a mouse is like three years old. <laughs> yeah. they, And then it says they got young mice. Uh, but it doesn't say whether or not they were male or female. And then it says persistent, persistent hyperactive behavior in female NSG mice motivated the use of male mice in the behavioral studies. So females had, they were hyperactive, more active than the males. And so, so the, the results make, could be more dramatically revealed if you used the, the mellower. That's the exactly what they did. Yes. Yes, they use the mellower animals, males. So, hey, good, good catch there, Blair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, don't worry, I won't ask for every single study. Because I was going to say, that thing's like, oh my God, this is a new whole segment that weaves through every story. Every story. You know what? I'm just not going to bring any more stories with animals. That's what I'm going to do. No. I'm going to avoid it. So, so in your next story on cannabinoids, were they male or female patients? Oh, that I don't know if the patients were male or female, but the uh, the the plants were all female. Thanks in large part to a widespread outbreak in medical marijuana legalization, there are 28 states currently allowing comprehensive medical cannabis programs. And according to this, nearly 10% of cannabis users in the US are utilizing the drug uh, for its medicinal reasons or utilizing the medicine for medicinal reasons. Researchers are busy examining the Mary medicine for use in treating nausea, arthritis, chronic pain, anorexia, list goes on. And dermatologists are now looking into its ability to fight a range of skin disease. Quote a voice from Dr. Robot, ro robot, Dr. Robert Della Vale, MD Associate Professor of Dermatology, University of Colorado School of Medicine. Perhaps the most promising role of cannabinoids is in the treatment of itch. He noted that in one study, 
eight of 21 patients who applied to cannabinoid cream twice a day for three weeks completely eliminated severe itching or paritis. And it may have reduced the dry skin that gave rise to the itch in the first place. So, you know, small sample size, but this is uh, also building on other studies that are that are now showing up because of because it's now legal to research it, right? Also believes the primary driver in these cannabinoid treatments could be their anti-inflammatory properties, and the studies he and his fellow researchers reviewed uh, that they found. The THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient in marijuana, reduced swelling and inflammation in, in, uh-oh, shoot. Here I thought I had a clean study. They reduced swelling and inflammation in mice. Male or female mice, we may never know because I don't have the whole cohort thing here. At the same time, the mice with melanoma saw significant inhibition and tumor growth when injected with THC. These are topical cannabinoid drugs with little or no psychotropic effect that can be used for skin disease, he says. Still, he cautioned that most of these studies are based on laboratory models and large-scale clinical trials have not yet been performed. That may change as more and more states legalize cannabis and more and more purported uses for the medicine seek their scientific verification validation. So yeah, pretty goes- soon, individuals will be able to eat their weed, put their weed on their skin, put their weed in their hair, um, drink their weed, <laughs> take weed-based medicine, yeah. wear their weed. Yeah. And I do know that I do know that uh, some people do use already uh, skin balms that are uh, cannabis-based. Um, but I thought that there was actually uh, in those particular compounds that there was psychoactive. Oh, a psychoactive result. Uh, so they go on to say, those who have used medications for itch and skin disease without success uh, may find a viable option here. Yeah, if they're using the uh, not necessarily the active ingredient, but a cannabinoid that's not mm-hmm. like like it says the psychotropic. Right, right. And, and you know the mental what stuff. What he's talking yeah, about here awesome. isn't psychotropic, but um, you know the 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 variety of applications for you know this is this is such a wild having having grown up having yeah but it's sort of like having grown up hearing about like well you can you can make rope and pants and it's also good for now it's good for eczema like i mean like it's a big list for something that we have refused as a society of laws to allow the research the path to which it leads. And now, uh, now the, uh, the dam is busted. So that's putting on your skin. I've got one more, one more story I'm going to follow this up with, uh, which is next time you have a frog in your throat, consider sticking one up your nose as well. <laughs> not only... <laughs> what? Not, not only huh? is it a good look, but it just might cure what ails you if you choose the right type of frog. Turns out that a component in the skin mucus secreted by South Indian frogs can kill the H1 variety of influenza viruses. Nice. What? So frog skins were known to secrete host defense peptides uh, to defend the frog from varieties of bacteria. The finding by researchers, this is from Emory Vaccine Center and the Rajiv Gan. Gandhi Center for Biotechnology in India suggests that the peptides present a resource for antiviral drug discovery. Uh, Going on that Mm -hmm. anti-flu peptides can be handy when vaccines are unavailable and the case of a new pandemic strain or when circulating strains become resistant to the current drugs, says senior author Joshi Jacob, PhD associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Emory Vaccine Center. Imagine so. This is uh, this is also uh, kind of this this particular peptide that they're talking about has a very unique effect on the flu virus, uh, which which really uh, to the point of making it sort of universal for H ones. So Jacob and his colleagues, well, this is they named one of the antiviral peptides they identified as 
Urumin, after a ridiculous whip-like sword called Urumi, used in southern India centuries ago and likely abandoned because it's so unwieldy that you are more likely to injure yourself practicing with it than gaining any advantage on the battlefield. I have no idea why they chose this. Seems very obscure. But uh, Urumin, that's the peptide, not the ridiculous whip sword thingy, was found in skin secretions from the Indian frog Hydrophlex uh, Bahavistra. Peptides is these short chains of amino acids, building blocks of proteins. Some of these antibacterial peptides work by punching holes in cell membranes. So they are toxic uh, to mammalian cells as well, but this particular peptide was not. Instead, it appear appears to only disrupt the integrity of flu virus uh, as th seen through the electron microscopy that they did. Microscopy. So it binds to the stock of the hemagglutinin, mm -hmm. which is a less variable region of the flu virus. So it's less variable, meaning more flu viruses have this region. It's been the goal of the universal vaccine to target this region. So we have other, we have other, uh, all the other anti-flu drugs and things that are out there, they're targeting different parts, uh, different regions of the of the flu virus is and and those differ between different flus right yeah. that's this why you have h1 a, and n5 h h2 and 7 h yeah you have these different varieties yeah yeah so so this one could could actually be usefully uh applied to a a host of viruses What's sort of interesting here, there's a, there's a, there's a line in the story I'm reading. It says, because flu viruses from humans cannot infect frogs, producing uramin probably confers on frogs an advantage in fighting some other pathogen. But wouldn't that also be like, wait, maybe that's why they can't get the, the human virus. Maybe that's why they don't get the flu. Yeah, yeah. That's why they don't get it, because it's there. Like, that's what's already doing the thing that you discovered that it does. Just go with that. <laughs> Well, right frogs now. are really sensitive to a lot of things because they have porous skin. So there's there's such this direct connection between their entire surface area and the internal everything in their mm -hmm. body that it, it makes sense that they would kind of have some extra ammunition against any host of potential diseases or infections or any number of things. Um, so I think this makes sense, but I also yeah. think this is a great reason to remember again uh, that there are all sorts of untapped resources for our own benefit in the medical field that we haven't even found yet. And most frogs, a lot of frogs live in the rainforest. Rainforest is already uh, under attack for a lot of reasons, mainly habitat destruction, but now also I think on the show, but if not, definitely I shared out through social media, a study earlier this year that said that frogs are extremely susceptible to climate change, in particular the ones in the rainforest, because of uh, changes in rainfall pattern and temperatures and all these sorts of hosts of things. But I think it's, this is a perfect example of, you know, we knew plants had a lot of medicines out there to offer us, but there might be some on the back of a frog that could help us eliminate the flu. How cool it. would that be? And, and yeah, and this was, this amazing. was specifically, Ermin, okay, so they delivered uh, intranasally to uh, uh, yeah, Ermin protected, like a, unvaccinated like a mice. Fluist. Yeah. So the ermine yeah. protected the unvaccinated mice against a lethal dose of H1 strains of flu, uh, which would have been like the one that happened back in 2009. It was not, however, effective uh, against other current strains such as H3. So we need to find more frogs. <laughs> find more frogs. Find other, yeah, to be able to uni really universally. But I mean, if we can protect ourselves against the H1 version of that. Yeah. That's a lot. And those are some That's, of the big ones too. The, those are more pandemic strains. Twist warns you not to just go out and stick a frog up your nose. That is not what we're suggesting. You gotta know what no. kind of frog it is. Yeah, you have to <laughs> identify the frog first to make sure it's the one used in this study. Don't, don't stick a frog some of the, in your nose. There's even some frogs that are poisonous. You know, there's yeah, a poison yeah, right. frog. Sounds stick so one of those up your nose. Yeah, it's gonna mm. be a bad rest yeah, of the so day. Yeah, so I just wanted to be clear. Twist does not condone 
sticking random frogs up your nose. <laughs> no, and unless it, you're doing it for science. Oh boy. No, unless no, you're not like even really then. Methodic, no. Just unless no. you have not no, even then. Not even really a good idea. Chris doesn't. <laughs> Chris doesn't recommend putting things up your nose. How's that? Yeah, we do not. <sighs> but we do like caves. <gasps> caves yes. are fun. And um, last week, Blair, you talked about uh, an evolution story, kind of talking about natural selection and how um, basically the one group it kind of you kind of thought it should have disappeared over time based on selective properties, but it stuck around. So there was definitely some kind of balance to having it in the population over time. And so this story here is a different different side of that altogether. Uh, published this week in BMC Biomed Central Evolutionary Biology. This is an open access article of Anybody can read it if they want to. You can download the PDF. Super interesting about blindness in cave-dwelling organisms, specifically looking at um, blind uh, cave fish. So fish in caves, they're blind. Why are they blind? Why don't they see? Why aren't there any sighted cave fish in the caves? Um, and long story short, they... Um, they came up with a model of the, the fundamentals of the evolutionary process at hand, the drift, selection, mutation, and also migration that can possibly happen to get individuals out of caves. And they looked at the interaction of three forces. So selection that was favoring alleles that cause bl blindness. So there's certain alleles that say, okay, you're, you're not going to be, your eyes don't detect light versus the alleles that say your eyes do detect light, right? What's the selection that favors that? The interaction also with immigration of sighted alleles from a surface population, and then also mutations that create the blindness alleles. And they looked at the dynamics of this model and pretty much found that uh, these blind cave fish are blind because if they, would, if they could see, they would leave the cave. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> now, Come again, pre pretty much long story short is individuals with eyes that could detect light didn't want to stay left. in the cave. They left. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> That is a type of selection. Absolutely. That is the selection. And so in for blind cave fish and possibly many, many other, if not all species of blind animals in caves, the reason they're blind and live in caves is because the ones that could see didn't want to be there and took off. Okay, so the extrapolation is that when there are elements of an environment that are not ideal, those that remain cannot sense the problem. Is right. that why I'm still in my hometown and everybody else seems to? <laughs> yeah. So sensing. <laughs> Not you in particular. No, we're talking about you, Justin. Why do you have to make it about yourself? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just started. Like I grow. I moved away. Yeah. You just can't tell. Hmm. Yeah, so um, the secondary aspect of this also is that uh, eyes, the metabolic cost of having light sensing organs, um, it's not low necessarily. So, um, yeah, they just genetically drift that it just, that's, yeah, blind cave fish, blind because they stayed. The blind and survived ones stayed because no one survived. else was there, probably. Right. Yeah. So it's a it's a very interesting model of evolutionary uh, selection for an interesting trait. And then it's also weird that it's uh, oh, it's, it's also what? weird to me that 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 fish could would lose it because uh, you know mouth like head like having all this like having eyes near a mouth so that you can find food. Uh, happened in some of the started in some of the earliest life forms uh, that led to us that you know so it seems like it's such a fundamental trait that that developed probably on uh, uh, where, where the disclaimer started on that on that silt on the ocean floor deep deep down in the darkness 
that even within a cave, you'd be you'd be trying to maintain uh, whatever vision was possible. Like, why not come up with night vision? Like, have night vision fish or illuminate. Like, it seems like that would be something worth finding other energies to to to, to throw at to keep around. But you no. Know, Maybe maybe this explains it. Maybe maybe this does explain it. That all all the ones that were predisposed with vision you know, left. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, there's also the mutation rate. You have to have specific mutations to be able to allow for other traits to develop. Um, and if no other traits have developed that have been uh, substantially effective enough to increase the fitness of individuals, then they're not really going to catch on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyway, blind cave fish. They looked at Astianics mexicanus, and it is one of the most well-studied cave dwelling species inhabiting caves for approximately 5 million generations. Wow. That's dedication. A That's a lot of generations. Million years. It's a lot of generations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, kind of fascinating. Yeah, um, I've got quick stories now. We're down to the end of our show. Wow, we're getting there. We're getting there. Quick stories. Large Hadron Collider has tantalizing sniff, ta tantalizingly sniffed the hints of a new particle. Um, but you know, we're not going to say that they have found a new particle because they haven't. Ta-da! Um, this is uh, the LHCb experiment is seeing fluctuations in these really short-lived particles called B mesons, and they're looking at how these, um, how when protons smash together, what happened with these mesons, and then what what they turn into, and the particles that come off of them, the quarks and the anti-quarks, and what's happening, and other mesons, and all sorts of stuff. And they've got some results that are interesting, but it's not significant yet. It's uh, an anomaly with a significance be below 2.5 sigma, which really in physics means I don't know why I'm reporting on this. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, um... No, seriously, in physics, it's nothing because the five sigma threshold is what we need to actually claim a discovery. They Physicists are nowhere near saying they have a discovery. This is a PR stunt to keep people excited about the LHC because the LHC is coming back online right about now from its winter break. And so there's going to be a lot more data and maybe we will find more tantalizing hints and maybe we won't. And maybe it'll go mm -hmm. and the standard model will stand. As always, what? with nothing challenging yeah. it. Uh, yeah, that'd be boring. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, it's probably what will happen. It will be boring. My money's yeah. with finding something interesting. Well, we haven't found uh, anything uh, interesting uh, yet. Yeah, no, nothing interesting is coming out of nothing the LHC. Nothing we haven't yeah. predicted. That's and that's that's sort of that's so disappointing. And yet, yes, confirms uh, like okay. There was there was a lot of a lot of folks who were taking courses in potentially non standard model physics that might just be like eh, yeah I'm going I'm gonna take those other classes now that's sort of more mainstream because nothing has illuminated us to go in a really necessity of a different direction at this point um, so it's a little bit boring but yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be good to know it'll be great to know. Um, it's gonna be good. I don't know go. what goes on with that physics. That's right. We like know. we like the physics, and you know what? A lot of people also like Pokemon Go. Hmm. Yeah, a lot oh, of people stop. are playing. I'm, yeah, I'm boycotting. Of, I'm boycotting this particular segment. Okay, you just just turn your yeah turn your microphone off there and your video. Okay, I see you're just totally boycotting. Oh my! Um, a lot of uh video game uh augmented reality and uh, virtual reality research has been done looking at the negative aspects of uh of how video games affect behavior you know make socially isolate people keep people from actually interacting with other people maybe increase aggressiveness and um, you know all sorts of kind of negative personality traits have been suggested not that there's actually ever been found 
any data that supports that. Um, so these researchers publishing in the Journal of Media Psychology, they decided they were going to look specifically for positive stuff. And so they're like, hey, Pokemon Go, it's a social game. Let's look at um, uh, things related to things like people are people who have social anxiety going to be less likely to play the game? Is social anxiety going to reduce mm. their positive feelings from playing the game? How? What kind of results are going to come from playing Pokemon Go? And uh, they pretty much discovered from their analysis of individuals who were uh, were playing this game, it was like 18 to uh, 21 year olds or something like that, um, that this kind of a game, this Pokemon Go social augmented reality type of game actually had very positive uh, positive effects on individuals. Wait and a second. Was, Are you telling me that was, they went out to discover <laughs> of the game and their result was they found positive effects from the game that is incredible yeah, it's I'm incredible so surprised that they found the thing that they set out to find before they just looked at stuff that's yeah. Great but they science. didn't they they had many hypotheses that they were working on and they did expect to see uh fewer people with social anxiety uh having positive benefits from it actually because it's a social game they expected those individuals to have very negative responses to the game and uh those individuals did not they i mean they weren't as ex as positive about it as people without social anxiety, but they still really enjoyed playing the game. And they had... Um, because, because you don't have to socially interact with a human being to play the game. Like, that's not a thing that this actually... Like, some yeah. people do, but for the most part, they don't. What they do is they drive through a neighborhood that nobody else went to at five miles an hour collecting the pokey thingies. They did find that gameplay was associated with increases in social behavior. Yeah, wanna, and I know exactly pretty. what that social behavior is. That social behavior is me being surrounded by three people who's like, hey, I picked up a kooky what's it with the other. Oh, where'd you find a kooky what's it? I've been looking for a kooky. I don't have a kooky what's it yet. Oh, you got to go over here and then you got to go over there and then wait till like three o'clock in the morning and there's like a kooky what's it show up. It's like, oh, like, yeah, they're all talking about this, this completely inane thing. Insane. Well, okay, but uh, and I'm okay, being so highly I, judgmental. You yeah, are being and, highly and that's, judgmental. That's what I would say is, as per somebody <laughs> who I'm not about time wasting never, games, as somebody who's never been interested in Pokemon and did not play the game at all, I will say that it's not that different from other things that people get interested in. They were Absolutely. talking about the cookie what's its and where to find that. Maybe you talk about where your favorite craft beer is with somebody else who is buying some craft beer, right? What could possibly be the difference there? If it causes two people to have a conversation that weren't already going to have a conversation, that is the point of this study. And actually okay. I did okay. read Here's another positive study about Pokemon Go where it increased people's steps. It increased people's activity out in the world. Now, whether it was into oncoming traffic, that's another right. conversation. But also, that that thing has been heavily hacked to the point where there's people who are virtually now walking to right. locations. Yes. So it's like, like, it's like, how can we do this without walking? Oh, it's like, ever. but they, they probably still count the footsteps, even though somebody walked from California to Japan. Well, it's not, yeah, and it's not everybody, but the, the very end, the last couple of sentences from this paper, I mean, they're looking at this with, uh, with eyes wide open, I think. They say, our results hint at a moment in time where simply playing a video game might have made people happier, encouraged nostalgic reverie, created or deepened friendships, and motivated players to walk around their neighborhoods. These experiences might also have enhanced players' well-being. We hope that future research can build on this work and continue to expand our understanding of augmented reality gameplay and positive media effects. Future research doesn't even necessarily have to be done on Pokemon Go. And now Look, my I, final... I, I just, sorry, my finishing thought on that is like, I'm all for gaming. I think gaming does wonderful things for our society. I think it keeps kids off of 
crime. And I think it's, you know, it's going to keep elderly actively, agilely, mentally involved in doing something even that, even when physical uh, ability to go out and interact with the world is reduced. Uh, I think there's a lot of positives that we're going to have from gaming as a society. But I think all of the talk uh, about the, uh, the the socialized like community of uh, I think it's I think it's hype uh, and 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 so you know whatever don't listen to me what do I know <laughs> my, on my my last don't story. listen to me I'm I don't know gonna, what I'm about. I, I don't know what you know <laughs> what do you know I don't know <laughs> moving on to my last story for the evening oh, but, uh, oh, oh no I'm, I'm going to stop but no, I was going to say, done. I forgot I, wanted, that I wanted to interrupt earlier. The difference between the talking about the craft beer that's down at this particular place and the Pokemon thing is there's actually a physical craft beer being brewed <laughs> by people using science to make a beer that you can taste and drink and interact with physically. It's a real object in the Have world. Have you ever played a game, Justin? Good question. Uh, Have you ever played chess. a game? I play chess. I play chess. All right. Do you play of... imaginary games with your kids where you make up characters? Do you run around and, and you know, make up characters yeah, and role things playing things imaginative play? I mean, come on. It's I just know, because it's not game about one play. Game. Just because it's not. Play. Just because everybody <laughs> else is playing it and I don't really get it. Um, you don't bitter. have to play this particular game, so stop being I bitter. bitter that I didn't, there we go. No. Something that can that maybe hopefully will make you feel happier is that now on those moments when you are liking to be socially isolated and hanging out, just looking at pictures on your computer, you can now search all of NASA's images videos and animations I, all got, got, of them whereas before right they've been me. yeah but before each of the nasa uh, locations uh have their different databases and their different files and putting things places and so jet propulsion laboratory has images on their computers and then kennedy space center has their images on their computers and they've been these disparate places and it, unless you really know what you're doing it's hard to search for specific images within nasa's database but it's not hard any longer because now nasa has worked with a company called info info zen to put all of their images on the cloud and so all of the images Every single one of them is now available, and you can search it if you just go to images.nasa.gov. And it's super easy. You nice. can search for anything you want to search for. So if we want to search for Jupiter right now, for instance, and just let it do its little thing, suddenly we show up with um, oh, images rad. and videos related to Jupiter. So whatever search terms, things that are involved in NASA's purview, all of the images, the media is online for you to search. So this is gonna be hours and hours of fun for one. Yeah. It, which oh. it used to just be, they would put their like best pictures up there first. And then you'd be like, right. oh, oh, these are the best Jupiter pictures I've ever seen. Now you gotta wade through 1700 images of just half junk 90 percent junk just like I, I can't even tell is that jupiter i can't even tell that's jupiter that looks like a that looks like a rock like a close-up picture of like a rock i found at the beach like i can't even tell on some of these but you know yeah all of them that's better beautiful <laughs> images <laughs> you're you're being I very cranky person all of a sudden i don't you know what did. happened <laughs> are you well, kids in their video games damn nasa tell me too much give me too much information i think you must be low blood sugar all right blair close hey, us blair, out with a couple of yeah stories. are you are you gonna tell me to stop shouting now justin <laughs> because i have stories about noise <laughs> noise <laughs> story is about road noise so when that person steps into traffic because they were looking for a jigglypuff <laughs> that traffic <laughs> noise <laughs> it's one of three i know that traffic noise 
could be affecting <laughs> animals. In fact, we've talked about it before. Noise pollution is a big deal. But a recent study uh, from the University of Virginia, sorry, George Mason University in Virginia, looked at North American flycatchers, particularly eastern wood peewees. And They're cute. They, I love wood peewees. Yeah. And they, they studied them in three parks within the greater Washington, D.C. Mm. area. They recorded songs and they recorded road sounds. They recorded during a 36-hour closure and then on a normal day. Overall, they found that when there's a lot of traffic noise, they the the little peewees changed the frequency of their song and shortened the duration of their song. And so this means their, their song is actually completely changing when there is traffic noise. This may or may not be part of the reason that their population has fallen by over 50% in the last 70 years. So the, the suggestion from this article and this study is to do some road closures during mating season. So we get road closures, certain hours of road closures. So if we can study these little peewees and find out what time of year and what time of day they are most active and singing, then we can try to reduce traffic noise. Or, you know, my idea would be to just um, make electric cars. Electric cars would be a lot oh. quieter, um, or at least electric, uh, the louder vehicles are, um, you know, semi-trucks and the, the larger construction equipment-based vehicles. If we can get those off of the giant diesel engines and onto electric or fuel cell-based um, motors, then we're going to be dealing with a, a much quieter situation. I mean, seriously, I can't see us at rush hour going, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Nobody can drive through here right now. Yes. The peewees are singing. The peewees. As much as we love the birds, I have a hard time thinking. If you love them so much, why don't you marry them? Oh, my God. I was hoping you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to mention tonight, speaking of noise, is about the noise of flowing water. You're going to make me have happen? to peewee. Yeah, to peewee. Well, if you're a plant, that sound will make you grow your roots towards the source of running water. We've talked before on the show about plants listening to what's going on around them. In this case, a study uh, from the University of Western Australia found that plants are listening to water sources. They, they tested different types of water sources near the roots of plants, actual running water, artificial running water, water running in a tube. And they found that the plants will grow their roots towards running water. They were not fooled by recordings of running water and that they only change the direction they grow their roots towards water if they're thirsty if they don't have a lot of water in the soil. And this study was done with the common garden pea plant, the same plant that was the species of study for Gregor Mendel in yeah. the genetics test. How? I have questions. So oh, it's, is it's, it's, not chemo, it's not, not is chemotaxis? Is it? This is a great question. Is it toward vibration? <sighs> Like, yeah, so they I would know it's not a chemical an audio signal. audio recording creates vibrations. That's what not so a recording They know it's yeah. not a chemical symbol, signal because they responded to it running in a pipe. Right. So it's they, vibrational, but... But, but if the, pipe the recordings... Is a also a so, so if it's the vibrations, then it has to be very subtle or very sensitive to those vibrations because the recording has to be gosh darn near the actual no, thing the, in terms of vibration. No, the recording can be anywhere, but the playback of that recording, the speaker itself would need to be embedded in the soil to recreate. And that's what they did because they were yeah. testing if the roots would follow the direction of the sound. Wow. Mm -hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. TBD on that, but they think it probably has to do with 
the vibrations? Probably, I would think it would have to do somehow with vibrations, but then to isolate how the vibrations of the running water would be different from, you know, in the tube would be different from the speaker. That, that That's amazing to me. What yes. would that it, be? And the implications what? of this. What is going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The implication of this is that sound pollution does not just mess with peewees. It could mess with plants. If plants suddenly can't hear, quote unquote, where this water is, that could affect survival of plants. So it when we do studies on sound pollution, now perhaps plants have to be part of that conversation. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So just wanted to leave that out in the quick news, blow everybody's want mine and just kind of yeah. Walk away. Wah, 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 wah. Why, why running water though? I mean, it, water under the ground does it? It doesn't run really. I mean, what, how? The water what, table, I guess. The water table. I, I. There's so many things about this that are strange. I need more research. More research, plant scientists. Come on, let's. I need. I need more details on this one, and quickly. Yes. So TBD. I'll I'll be in touch. And 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 then, and the other thing too is, can you stimulate the growth of a plant by simulating running water in these pipes in every direction? Like, can you get a really insanely like strong root system by surrounding your potted plants with a hose that? Right. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. No. That this would be. This is like. Fun, fascinating, but but stop playing opera for your plants because apparently they don't care. We don't know if they don't well, care about but opera. Maybe they they do. The roots might not care, but maybe the shoots do. That's such oh, an yeah. interesting point, though. How many kids' science experiments have there been about what music to play for your plants? And everyone's like, "Ah, oh, plants can't hear, though. This is so weird. Like, what is the? This is now the proof that they can do something like hear." We don't know what it is. They don't have ears, but they can do something, something analogous to hearing. So it makes perfect sense that they wouldn't like heavy metal if it's something that signals something metal, bad, for example. Water, water well, flowing well, through water thing. flowing it's through a tube might no water flowing through a tube might induce an ionic current. Hmm. Okay. Ooh. So we could be dealing with um, uh, sensitivity to changes in ion, uh, in, in charge, change in charge. Oh, yeah. Something like that. Curious, I think you should call, call the University of Western Australia real quick. Yes. And, and, also, and also, what is what is hearing? What is hearing? What do we hear with? Tiny I little agree. hairy filaments within our ear. Yeah. Right? What's picking up the sound? What are, what are plants covered with? Roots and leaves have tiny little... Hairs or stocks have little tiny hairs on them, so yeah, of course they can hear their whole their whole body is a is well vibrating. But this is something else. Audio it's organ. Some, this, it, I don't think it's hearing we're talking about. I think it is something yeah, different. But yeah, I think I like. I, if I said that before Ions. you said the thing that you said, then that would have been more interesting. But now that you said the other thing, I actually agree <laughs> with you before I just got this. Ah, all oh, right, goodness. all right. Well. We can have this discussion have we done it? go on and on and on. Yes, we've done it. We have come have to we, the end. We've done it. Come to the end of another show. And I would just love to thank everyone for listening to this show. And also want to take this moment to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, Chris Clark, Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, John Ratnaswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Jared Lysette, Kevin Parachan, Andy Grove, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Brian Hedrick, John Gridley, Stephen Bickle, Kevin Railsback. Gerald Sorrells, Ulysses Adkins, Derek Nickel, Dave Friedel, James Randall, Eric Schwab, Bob Calder, Mark Nassaros, Ed Dyer, Trainer 84, Layla Marshall Clark, Charlene Henry, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele, Gerald Onyago, Steve DeBell, Greg Guthman, Brian Staub, 
Patrick Cohn, XB, Daryl Lambert, Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Schneiderman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Richard Porter, Rodney, David Wiley, Robert Aston, Todd Northcutt, Arlene Moss, Aurora Lee, Bill Kersey, Ben Rothick, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, Cosmic Gypsy, Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Neves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom Shiwata, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rick Ramos, Gary Swimsburg, Phil Nadeau, Braxton Howard, Sal Good Sam, Metz, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insom, a honey moss. Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, John Maloney, Jason Olds, James Paul West, Alec Doty, Aluma Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luthan, Marjorie, David Summerlee, Tyler Harrison, Columbo Ahmed. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. And if any of you are interested in finding out more about Patreon, you can find information at Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash This Week in Science. Also, you can help us out simply by telling people about twists. And on next week's show, once again, we will be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch and you can join our awesome chat room. Hey, everyone in the chat room. Thanks for chatting. And if you can't make it, don't worry. You can find past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube or simply or facebook.com slash this week in science or twist.org. That's it. Yeah. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look up Twist, the number four droid app in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can what? also make comments, like by listing all of the types of Pokemon that you know, and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. <laughs> or you can contact us directly. Uh, email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistmeaning at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, which is spelled T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, your email will be immediately spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from the show, please remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just that understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye, 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 eye. 
because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. And we have come once again to the end of a show. It's a long one. We have filled two hours with so much science. So much for you. We hope you march for science, if you can, if you will. March for science, April 22nd. And I was just looking at my calendar. Calendar. Um... You know, the twist, twist calendar, Blair's wonderful art. Speaking of frogs, it's a pretty frog for the month of April. Earth Day, April 22nd, same day as the March for Science. And then if you keep going into the following week, the 24th, World Day for Laboratory Animals. You can celebrate lab animals next Monday. Next Tuesday is World Penguin Day. So everyone can do a penguin dance, like in Happy Feet. World Penguin Day. And then uh, I think we were going to do a green show or something. I don't know if we're going to theme up for next week. Should we? I don't know. Um, and yes. Then on <laughs> yeah, yes. And then on Thursday is World Tapir Day. Yay! Friday, Arbor Day. And Saturday, Save the Frogs Day. I oh think my gosh, this, what a busy month. This, this week is the busiest week in this entire calendar. It's like all of a sudden everything fell on this last week of April. Like the, honestly, looking through the calendar, I'm like, why aren't other weeks so filled with days? There are many days, but not the same. Last week of April. Yeah, turns out. It's happening. It is happening. You know what science I'm really thankful for? Hmm. Aspirin. I'm thankful. Are you having adverse results from it since you're a woman? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I guess I don't mean aspirin. I mean ibuprofen and acetaminophen. And mm. I mean, I've taken normal aspirin before too, but um, mostly those. Uh, naproxen, stuff like that. Um, I have a headache right now. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe you should eat some chocolate. Chocolate. Okay, give me it. Or some. You're going to have some. <laughs> Can't quite reach it. Mm. Well, I just gave Vader a haircut. Ooh, let me see. He doesn't look nearly as bad when he's missing part of his helmet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if only I could give him a mullet. Oh, man, that'd be great. Yeah. So this is chocolate that we made ourselves. We had to go run around at the last minute before Easter to find free trade chocolate chips. 
because my son really, really, really did not want non-free trade chocolate on Easter. He's very concerned about child slavery. Good. Mm -hmm. Good for him. He's already yeah, so. an engaged citizen. Mm-hmm. And so now we have a lot of chocolate. I'm going to be eating it for the next year. Mmm, chocolate. It's everywhere now. Chocolate. Ooh, where's Justin? Is I don't know. Back? I need to share something. Oh, please. Copyright infringement. I ate the copyright infringement. <laughs> ah! are, we, are you turning? Are you, what are you doing? Are you watching us while we're... I, not intentionally. Mm. Two hours, eight seconds. We did a good long show today. It's because of that just, added segment. <laughs> it was the added segment, and then I just couldn't say no to some stories. There was one that I really wanted to talk about too, about the um, like the ice islands in the sea. Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Oh, not that one. No, I'm not finding my story because it's not on this computer. I had it up on another computer. Mm. Planet <laughs> Earth narrowly avoided getting struck by a giant asteroid or meteorite tonight. Asteroid did not. Um, did too. No, uh, it was the size of what is that six football fields wide? And it whizzed past. Whizzed past at 1.8 million uh, kilometers. I think is the equivalent of 1.8 billion meters from the Earth. Which uh, is how far? Let's put, that sounds pretty far. That's like uh, five times the distance between uh, Earth and the moon, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's like five times. It's the, but, but that's still the moon and then... Five times the distance. If it were between the moon and Earth, uh, then I'd be only like, ones you want. Okay, from now on. I don't right. care about the ones that are like, that's distant. That's way out there. That's, that's not even a close. big object in our neighborhood. In our neighborhood. Close yeah. into our neighborhood. Where were you, Jupiter? I thought you were supposed to deflect or absorb all that garbage coming from. <laughs> Uh, well, right. now you can search for images of Jupiter to yell at. So thanks, Kiki, for that story. Um, Kiki, I have an animal-related question, particularly okay. Justin's favorite cats. Have you put a, a square on the floor in painter's tape for your cats yet? I need to do this. Not Justin's cats. Ha, 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 ha. That's funny. I don't have any cats. That's a funny um, joke. I'm, I'm going to take Dave Friedel's uh, suggestion and put a piece of tape, square tape on the floor and see what Justin does with it. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, in the Twitter feed of all these people putting uh, squares on the floor for their cats, there was one that said, yep, it worked. And someone put a tape square on the floor and the cat stared at it. And then the like 20 something year old son got up and stepped into the box and kept pointing down to his feet to try to get the cat get in there and the cat just stood there hey look what happens when you put a square on the floor it makes humans do weird things mm -hmm. yeah i don't know all i all i know is if i put anything on the floor my cat will sit on it try to play with it yeah basically mess with it in one way or another uh, oh. quick uh, real time correction. Strength is saying it was not five times uh, as far away as our moon, but four times. Ooh, oh, so much basically, closer. right there. <laughs> I have a package that I received. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. What is it? This package contained a shot glass. And a teach t shirt. This shot glass says biohack the planet. Uh huh. 
and has a t-shirt. Is that from Josiah? It's from Josiah. Oh. I got my CRISPR kit today. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, I put, oh I put the DNA. I put the DNA in the in the freezer. I put the CRISPR in the freezer, like it said to do. So it's not out here right now. Um, Isn't there already a drawer for that in the refrigerator? I think it's the I lower put, I, section. Yeah, and the I CRISPR, put, CRISPR. I, I put CRISPR, and I put the E. coli. Yeah, I put the CRISPR, CRISPR, and I put the E. coli in my um my with my butter in the fridge. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> So if Kiki's not here next week, we'll know why. We know yeah. exactly what happened. <laughs> exactly. It's, don't eat the butter. There's E. coli on the butter. Um, Blurry-eyed toast got, preparation in the morning. I got, I got petri dishes. I got pipette tips. Plastic gloves. I got microtubules to put dry ice in and explode. I got a pipette. <gasps> a pipette. I got a pipette. I use pipettes quite a bit. Uh, I got a in... I got a holder to put my oh. tubes in. Too. Yeah, and then I got a bottle, some sticks. Good, good. Some for scraping. It's for plating, for plating the agar in the colonies on the agar. And I got instructions. Oh, instructions are important. Well, that's handy. Instructions are very important for my CRISPR-Cas9 bacterial genomic editing kit. First thing you do, toss out the instructions. Ah, no. What? Way more so fun. So what are you going to make, Kiki? Uh, so this is a, a very... A pigeon with the nose of a pig and the wings of no. a bat? No. No, oh. no. This is a very specific kit, and it's for te it's good for teaching methodology and showing how this works. But uh, the intent is to take E. coli that uh, cannot exist on um, that if streptomycin is in place, then it will not grow, and then you induce you cut and clip and induce uh, insert. A gene that allows it to grow on uh, on media that has streptomycin. So basically, you go from E. coli not being able to grow in a particular environment, edit the E. coli, and it can then grow in an environment that was previously inhospitable. So, nice. yeah. yeah. Fallen into the clutches of an evil mad genius. I'm so excited. I'm going to be a mad scientist in my kitchen. I'm going to teach my six-year-old how to be a mad scientist. <laughs> I mean, he's been playing around with, we have, you know, he has a little kid's microscope and like other, he has rubber gloves and other little things. And he and his friend were playing around with like, gave them soda and water and different things. And they're like, we're doing experiments. And, you know. I'm like, okay, that's you're that okay. You're just playing. I'll teach you science. <laughs> hey, we made a uh, fully functional trebuchet today. Oh my Ooh, god, physics! For, there you go. Yeah, we had like, well, it's a little bit of physics, a little bit of engineering, a little bit of, um, but it was a sort of like potpourri sort of choice you homework. Mean potpourri, or maybe that. Um, <laughs> Like we had all these things we could choose to make and we were looking at this list and one of them was a Lego catapult. Sweet. So we go into this thing. It was just sort of, it's some homework assignment. And we go through this and first of all, we looked at the, inst the instructions were not really, actually, we, it's not that we threw them out. They were terrible. It's like, here's some Legos. Here's a catapult. Make a catapult out make, of Legos. Make a that's catapult. All, that's, Justin, welcome to the next generation science standards. Right. And it was like, sort of like, here's all these pieces that you may or may not have in a Lego collection. Some of these are probably from a Playmobil set. We don't know. Here's a picture. Right. And so we're starting to like gather up something like out of our Lego collection. And, uh, and then I realized like, this is not a catapult. 
we're not really we're, this is a, this is a trebuchet that they're that they're putting forward as a catapult there's a difference people there's i'm not sure i google know it. the difference google it uh, no you tell me trebuchet you're so smart trebuchet, trebuchet has is, has a has a core it's with a, a long cable right so it's it, it can be the case yeah uh, but it's also it's gonna it's going to utilize not stored energy but gravity uh gravity. as the propulsion and is is also can launch things further so anyway we get partway through realizing we don't have the right pieces and the instructions are junk and so we from scratch uh, created a trebuchet that could launch something a really decent distance. Like, it, it, you're both pretty proud of it today. That's but, awesome. Uh, nice. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah, you can science with Legos. You can science you can, with anything. You can totally science with Legos. Oh, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, but I think that's, I mean, I was saying that that's kind of what the next generation of science centers are. So they're trying to move away from a procedural giving instructions. Yeah. Just saying, yeah. here are your materials. Here's Do your it. procedure. Mm -hmm. Now follow these directions. Exactly. They're trying to make right. students find the methodology because if that's you great. think about it, this is actually one of the main disconnects. When we, when we bring it kind of back around to where we started the show tonight, the disconnect and the reason that people are marching for science this weekend is that people don't have faith in science because they don't understand how it works. Yeah. And they see these people in lab coats as these, um, these holders of information, these deliverers of things without process. And so by teaching kids science in a way where they discover the process on their own, they're not right. just following directions given, right? That is going to bridge this huge cognitive gap yeah. between what science is and what science means to the average person. So it's it's also part of participatory uh, learning or yeah. activity-based learning. So, and this is this whole thing. John Dewey basically introduced that to American education uh, in a big way in the early 1900s. And it is the way that our education system uh, sort of the direction it followed. Because before then, home ec was somebody sitting at the front of the class reading a recipe and everybody had to write it down and memorize it and if you could wrote repeat what was in that recipe aha then you passed you know your cooking class or whatever it was your home ec class and and the john dewey system was much more like what some of us may have experienced in a home ec class where you bake something right where you have not just the recipe that you need to remember but you actually go through the activity of making a loaf of bread or something in this class, right? Uh, and everything, this is what's bothered me about this whole teaching to the test uh, emphasis, is it, it was pushing us backwards a hundred years in what we had learned works and doesn't work in education. And it was basically saying, hey, we're gonna create a system now based on the system that didn't work before the system that's actually produced a lot of benefits to our society. Let's do that. That's a great idea. No, it's a horrible idea. So I love that the, uh, the, the fix is in, uh, again, to go back to what we were trying to do uh, and got started 100 years ago and has been working great for this country uh, now in, uh, in this Common Core stuff and, and getting kids to actively do the problem solving and and other levels of it too. There's, you know, a, a lot of emphasis nowadays in working in groups, where you're you're bringing your strengths to a project. Uh, if if you yeah. if you excel at public speaking, you may be the one to do the presentation, whereas somebody else may have done the mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the math. Um, paper yeah. mache construction and somebody else did the artistic play, like or whatever it is yeah. or the math yeah. portion yeah. of it or the right uh so learning how to integrate your own skill sets with those of others so education has has been i think in very recent years been taking some positive directions despite despite a lot of obstacles that have been thrown in its uh in its mm -hmm. way in terms of uh, government policy towards education, which right. is, has 
It's not going to get better anytime soon, unfortunately. Well, here's the silver lining is that certain areas. California. Are <laughs> continuing. California. With the forward progress. California. Despite some overarching decisions. A lot of the rest of the country. Well, there's even, you know, there's the testing that you talked about. There are federal mandates to continue these old antiquated tests despite the implementation implementation of new standards. They're, and they're and newly California antiquated. California has these said these are newly antiquated tests too. No. A lot of it. Yeah. No, this this the the California or the science testing, the majority of the science testing in the country is at least 20 years old. The majority, yeah. um, but the the they're developing new tests for the next generation science standards, and despite certain federal decisions to keep the old tests going at the same time, so now these kids will be tw tested twice as much. Uh, certain organizations, certain states, certain you know counties, certain cities have said, "Nope, not interested." <laughs> So California is one of them that so far has remained adamant that we will continue with the new standards. We'll continue to teach science and we will continue testing to those new standards. So, you know, fingers crossed in a time like this, all we can do is think globally and act locally, right? <laughs> so that's why we have these satellite marches all across the world happening this Saturday, because we can, we can, we can be, by acting in a local march, we can be part of a global movement. We can be part of something. We'll see whether or not uh, the movement itself grows. I mean, there's been a lot of concern by many uh, voiced about the politiciz politicization of science. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, you know, there it's already kind of been politicized. The process itself... Yeah should remain the process that it is. I mean, it should actually, hopefully the process can be improved. Um, but the end result that, you know, that uh, so many, I think, are marching for is for a reinstatement of reason and informed decision making, as opposed and government to- government funding to science. Yeah, as opposed to pandering and bias and- So, yeah, so, yeah. so two quick thoughts on politics. Politics is uh, is not <clears throat> is not politics just, is not a bad thing. It's well, what no, it's how we a, it's how we work together as people to to govern. That's what right? I was going to say. No, politics isn't just that 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 governing aspect of it. Politics is also the effect it has on everything. We're a society of laws, and how these laws come to be is. And how those laws affect things like actually acting on science or how we educate our children. The rubber meets the road uh, when politics meets actual, uh, actual uh, people uh, being able to pursue or listening to or government acting on. You know, there's, there's not a part of your life, really. I mean, we're talking about how science affects everything. There's not a whole lot in, in any of our day-to-day -day lives that aren't on some level affected by politics as well. Um, even if it's just the federal regulations that, that mandate that proper electro, uh, uh, electrical wiring went into my dishwasher scenario, like there's, there's politics involved even in that, okay? It's politics yeah. all the way yeah. down. So, so it's already everywhere politics pretending you can live and a society of laws and stay out of the political realm is ridiculous. That just, keep, that doesn't exist. The other aspect of it the, is the, the, the facts are not politicized. It should not be politicized is the thing. The decisions made based on those well, facts are, are, will be politicized no matter what, but whether well, or not there, a certain thing exists should not be a mm -hmm. political agenda. It's just a fact. No, I, I, to, no, I totally disagree. I totally disagree. I, this is this is the thing we're we're mixing up. Well, or I'm, I don't totally disagree. I totally Empiric agree and disagree. It depends on the politics that we're talking about. If the politics that we're talking about is the 
is the election-based politics of this party, that party, my power, your power, then absolutely, that should not be allowed to, to manipulate or ignore fact. But the real politics that I'm talking about are the fact that we're in a society of laws and everything that is political and legal affects everything that we do. If a fact becomes apparent, it should rise to the level of policy and therefore politics, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, but the, you, but the policy can't... and the politics should not be on whether or not it exists. It should, it should be on how to attack it or how to address it, right? So instead of this question of right. does carbon dioxide trap heat, it should be how much should we be regulating such and such thing, right? And that I think mm -hmm. is the big disconnect for me. What and is that the decision? is that is the problem that i see is that it, they're if you guys want to talk if they want to all sit there and talk about whether or not there should be a carbon tax or how much it should be that's politics and i can't do anything about that but if you are going to vote for something <laughs> right but if you are going to sit there and tell me that carbon dioxide has nothing to do with warming and that right. that, and guess, that this you know that yeah. humans so have my, nothing to do with carbon then I, that well, is something that i have trouble getting behind in any way at all right and my point to that is that exactly the scientific community cannot stay out of the fray of politics and expect policy to uh have uh benefits for science that's my point is that you have to realize you're already in the political body. You are already there, regardless of what portion of your day, your life, your occupation, your anything that you are existing in, you are also in that political pool. So you cannot stand on the sidelines and expect, well, if I stay out of politics, eventually uh, the politicians and the voters will understand the importance of the scientific findings and the research that's been done at this university. No, not you necessarily. have to be yeah. involved mm -hmm. for that to take place. That's how mm -hmm. politics affects everything because it's already everywhere. It's not yeah. like you've stayed out of the fray. You've been yeah, in the I fray. You just haven't put having a voice in that. And that's, I think so, that, yeah, it's, it's so I recently heard, um, an interview with somebody who used to be uh, a security officer for, um, you know, for national security. And they have spent their entire political career, uh, and it is a political career because they're in, you know, an arm of, of, our, of our government, right? Um, Nonpartisan. Okay. And so I don't know whether or not they actually are a nonpartisan individual. I'm sure they have some leanings, right? But they have never come out and said they are a Democrat or a Republican. But they have time and time again come out and spoken in support of or against legislation or actions, right? Based on his knowledge of national security. So that is kind of what I'm thinking about here is scientists say that so, some scientists have previously thought that they cannot participate in the discourse of politics because science is not partisan. And th while that, that should be true, that doesn't mean you cannot speak for policy, right? Which is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I would also like to see some uh, scientists run for Congress. And more are more scientists are running for political yeah. office, and there yeah. are um, there are action groups that are uh, working to get more more scientists into politics, if not either uh, act actively campaigning for an office than actually helping to advise because mm -hmm. uh, there are many people in office who just maybe they don't know scientists who know the things that they need information on. And so um, there are people currently working on these things, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, oh. it would be so great to have a scientist on the EPA. You know? Um, there are scientists who work for the EPA. Right, right. Right. But you know, one of the people in charge, which right now, <laughs> Yeah, not. exactly. You know, I think mean, we had, uh, God, I'm going to mess it up. Uh, okay, I'm not just, I'm just not going to say his name. Uh, but he was a physics professor out of Berkeley who was head of the Department of Energy 
Mueller. Uh, under Obama. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Stephen. Stephen Chu. What was his last name? Yeah, Stephen Chu. Chu. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So Stephen Chu, um, it, it, you know, and, and that's, that's catch up, right? And out of that, we actually ended up with the, the cars or cash for clunkers thing, which they needed a stimulus. They needed a way to stimulate the economy. And the Department of Energy had this other thing that it was on their wish list of, wouldn't it be great if we could convince everybody to buy a newer, more fuel efficient vehicle? And, and because they realized that opportunity also would have an economic gain or as a stimulus to jumpstart the economy, the two things came together and we had this program that looked like a financial thing for people to buy cars to get the economy going, but was also all about, in all of its detail, getting gross polluting older vehicles that were less safe and, or, or put out more carbons into newer vehicles with higher emission standards, with better fuel mileage, with everything else. So when you combine, when you combine fiscal policy, government policy with science, you get win-win situations that you don't if you're only looking at the economic side of things. Right? Uh, so we do need more scientists to have this voice. We do need them to be more active. They have a lot to contribute, whether, whether, uh, whether the, the scientific, or excuse me, whether the, the political establishment is ready to accept that or not, these voices need to be much louder. Think of all the, the lobbying and the voices and the influences that are actually sort of morphing the decisions or, or evolving the decisions that politicians make in policy. And, 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 and know that those, the voices of science have been on the sidelines and not proactive, of course we're going to see funding cuts across the scientific community and disciplines. Of course we're going to see that. You wouldn't expect anything else if you had hypothesized that experiment. You wouldn't, you would be like, oh, if we uh, have this one segment with zero input, chances are it will have very little input in the final result. Yeah, that's exactly what you would expect. So think about it uh, scientifically, scientists. Well, people. and especially if the information coming out of those areas are not in line with what the individuals they're, are. They're not using met- the scientific method. Yeah, of course. And it's all lawyers all, all the way down. Anyway. I am going to go to bed because tomorrow yeah, I've got a lot of stuff to do. So I'm going to take off and uh, head for the hills. We'll actually head for California tomorrow. I hope okay. uh, let me get out to Pleasanton this weekend. I'll be at the Robo Games. In that case, I guess uh, say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, night, Dr. Kiki. Kiki. (laughs) You guys are silly. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Come back next week. We'll do more science. Good night. Till then. Oh, wait. End broadcast. What button? Wait. Wait. What am I doing? Hit that.